Is that a dog? Okay, my dog is.
Okay, we can start now. Professor? Okay, shall we begin? Yes, sir. We can begin now. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to this webinar, a special webinar on global impact of biotech crops, its economic and environmental effects, and uh, with a special focus on Pakistan, you see. And I'm extremely thankful to ISAAA uh, for organizing this and also thankful to public and crop life for uh, uh, organizing and helping us to do that, you see. And I'm extremely thankful to all the participants and uh, all the panelists. Uh, and I hope that our federal minister uh, for national food security and research, Mr. Fakhar Imam, will be able to join us at some stage. And uh, we are happy to have all our panelists, you know, uh, including Dr. Raham Rooks, who has come all the way, who is uh, the presenting UK. And uh, before I do that, I would uh, like to the request the, the, the Dr. Odora Al Aldimita who is the, we normally call her Ola, you see, you know, so um, I'm, I'm sorry if, if, if your name has not been pronounced well. She is the director of ISAAA Southeast Asia Center and ISAAA Global College Center on crop biotechnology. And she has been interacting with all of us and have been a main force 
behind all all our activities you see so i would request her for some comments dr dodora please okay so i would like to start with the overview of the global status of by the crops we are now going to give this as a um as the opener or how do you say to introduce what uh Dr. Graham Brooks is going to provide us today. So I'm now sharing my slide and I hope you can see it well. So yes, is it okay? Can you see it well? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So the data that I'm going to present to you would be the 2018 data. And we have been putting together the 2019 and uh, we hope that we will, we will be waiting for that data because it's an exciting uh, set of uh, information again for the 2019. But to set the stage, we're now, I'm just going to present to you what happened during 2018, which would be the, the beginning or which will be the basis of um, the, the study that Graham Brooks will provide us today. So from 1996 to 2018, we have seen that by the crops continue to help meet the challenges of increased population and climate change. So this is what we have been experiences, experiencing from the start of commercialization. And since 1996 to 2018, we have been following the hectare or the area planted to buy the crops. And you can see here that uh, the total by the crop area has been increasing very fast from the beginning. And then here now we see that it has come to a plateau where there was a short, um, short duration of a decline and then it immediately went up. So this was the time when there was a very expanded or extended drought incidents in the US. That's why there was uh, a decrease in hectare or in area. Now we can compare it with the developing countries which has which had 103.1 million hectares and then the industrialized countries which had 88.6 million hectares. Now in 2012 there was a time when the global area was divided equally between the developing and the industrialized countries. But you see here now that developing countries has already gone up way, way down uh, above the industrialized countries. So this is interesting to note that there are now more uh, area planted to developing countries because we have realized the potential of buy the crops in our quest for food security. Now here are, is the data for the buy the crops by trade. And you see here that the herbicide tolerance has gone up very fast. And this is because of the herbicide tolerant soybean. But you see that it has gone down already because the stock trades has been gaining grounds. Uh, I mean, a more area planted to the stock trades with combined our stocks, insect resistance and herbicide tolerance traits. These are deployed in many crops already. And uh, the insect resistant one has been there, but we're looking at um, a rise in insect resistance because of the need for controlling the fall armyworm, the corn earworm, and uh, the corn rootworm, what, which has been devastating uh, the um, developing countries. Uh, we know that corn is a very important crop not only in developing countries, but also in industrialized countries. In terms of the, uh, the crop, we see that biotech soybean has dominated and it has retained its 50% of the global biotech crop area. This is followed by maize, cotton, and canola. And um, these are the two most important ones because livestock, food, feed, and processing depends on um, biotech soybean and biotech maize. So most of the principal biotech crops 
are here pre presented and we see that 78% of the soybeans is already biotech. So uh, in 2018, 123.5 million hectares were planted to soybeans and 78% of that is already biotech. You see that it is almost saturation, uh, very close to 80, 90, 100%. Now we go to cotton, which has 76%. Maize had 30% of the global area and canola had 29%. Now, uh, maize looks like we need to exert a lot more efforts to uh, encourage countries to plant maize because we know that there are a lot of uh, maize is a good material, raw material, not only for livestock, but also for biofuels and oils and uh, many more. So uh, in 2018, there were 26 countries which planted by the crops. So you can see here the 26 countries and Pakistan is number eight. So Pakistan has all, had always been in the top 10 of uh, by the crop countries. And uh, well, the continent of Americas were the highest, especially the North Americas at 46%, 42% for Latin America. And then we have 10% for Asia Pacific. We have 1.5% for Africa and 0.5% for Europe. Uh, in the Asia Pacific, we had nine countries which planted by the crops and Indonesia was the latest addition with their drought tolerant sugar cane. And then for the top five countries, we see that most of them are developing countries. So these are Brazil, Argentina, and India. So most of these, uh, they, they already cover 91.3% of the buy the crops in 2018. And in 2019, uh, it looks the same also that these are still the top five countries which have the cultivated buy the crops in, in 2019. We will provide that data very soon. And then we have here now the data on the number of approvals. And um, I would just like to say that ISA is holding or is hold, um, having this ISA GM approval database. You can find it at the ISA website. And it provides you the status of approved events for buy the crops in used in food, feed processing, and cultivation. So USA had the highest, had the most number of approvals at 544. Maize had the largest approved, is the largest event, Maize 137. And uh, herbicide tolerant corn, NK603, had the, ha had, most, had the most approvals in 28 countries, which is 61 approvals. And 70 countries have issued 4,349 regulatory approvals. So this is a data from 1996 to 2018. And from that time on, we have been, uh, Graham Brooks have been recording the contributions of by the crops to food security, sustainability, and climate change. So his talk today would be focused on the increased crop productivity, conservation of biodiversity, providing a better environment, reduction of carbon dioxide emission, and helping alleviate poverty and hunger. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm now going to stop share. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ola. Very, very comprehensive overview. Now I we would like to move on to Dr. Ram Rooks. He's from UK and he's from the PGA Economics Limited UK. He is an uh, agricultural economist with more than 30 years of experience of analyzing the impact of technology, policy changes, and the regulatory impact. He has since the late 1990s undertaken a number of research projects relating to the impact of agricultural biotechnology and written widely on his subject in peer-reviewed journals. This area is extremely important and we need many agricultural economists to, to tell us something about uh, you know, its impact because that, that's most important to, to, you know, to apprise 
the policy acres about the advantages of this technology. So over to you, Dr. Karam Brooks. Uh, wait, okay, can I have uh, a short minute first to, to show the webinar poll one, please? Because this okay. has to be put up before Graham Brooks' talk. Graham, can you stop share for a while? We'll have, um, I'm sorry, we'll have to see the, the webinar poll first. Thank you. Okay, so this is the webinar poll. Okay, come on, Dr. Kauser, you can introduce it. Yep, please go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Dr. Okay, so now I would like to invite everybody to respond to this poll. So the question is, what is the most important impact of crop biotechnology that resonates with you? It, it, is it increases farmer income, decreases pesticide spray, contributes to food security, reduces environmental footprint, all of the above or none of the above. Okay, we already have now 41 seconds and um, we have 108 participants. So let me please, um, okay, so I think we have only six seconds, I three seconds. All right, so can we have the, the result of the poll? Okay, so result, the results of the poll is here. 75% uh, said it's all of the above, all of the above. Thank you so much for your participation. Now we Thank can you, continue. Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we move on to Dr. Graham Brooks for his presentation. Are we um, sharing screen correctly now? Not yes. yet. Can you uh, make it a slideshow? Yeah. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to everyone in Pakistan. Uh, before I introduce um, the study, I'd just like to say I noticed um, one or two participants are raising their hands. May I just say, if you have a point or a question you want to make, can you use the Q&A button to get it through to us? That would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Graham, your PowerPoint is still not slideshow. It's still not in the presentation mode. It is in mine. OK, are you in the first slide? Um, are you... Can you share it again? Uh, stop share and then share it again because it's okay. not moving. Thank you. Uh, stop share. Yeah, there. Okay, thank you. I'm, uh, it's okay, we have time. Do you have that now? No, not yet. Can you share it? Well, according to my screen, it is shared. Okay, uh, maybe we can have EJ, can you share it? But you were supposed to control it, I, I thought. Yeah, no, I mean, um, Graham can say next slide, please. Okay, so you cannot share it because we can see it. Okay, there yes, you go. No, okay. No. okay, right. So you can start now, Graham. Uh, yeah, I can't control it now. Yeah, but you can just say next slide, please. Okay, please. thank you uh, very much. Um, can you move to the next slide, please? I, do, I am going today to present to you the latest update of our annual review of the impact of GM crops globally. This is in fact the 14th 
annual review we've undertaken when we started in 2004. And largely as a result of this work, um, I'm now an author or co-author of more than 30 papers on the impact of the technology around the world. And for those of you who want additional information, the contents of what I'm going to present to you are available in two open access papers in the journal GM Crops and Food. And the links that you can see there are where you can download this information. The papers are freely available on open access. Uh, additionally, for those of you who might want even more information, there's a report of more than 200 pages available on our website. Can I have the next slide, please? The analysis I'm going to present covers the period to 2018. It looks at the farm income and productivity impacts, focuses on farm income, yield and production and the environmental impact from two perspectives. One related to pesticide use change and its associated environmental impact. And secondly, related to greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of methodology, there is now a considerable body of literature, a lot of which is in peer reviewed journals, which we draw on. Um, we also do some of our own analysis because I'm sure many will appreciate there is not analysis available for every trait in every country for every year. To try and make the analysis as dynamic as possible, we're using current information on things like prices and yields and cost of production. We review pesticide usage and comparisons between typical GM versus conventional treatments. And we use the indicator, the environmental impact quotient um, when we're looking at pesticide use change, because just looking at changes in the amount applied is a poor measure of environmental impact. The EIQ is also a fairly crude indicator, but it's nevertheless better than just using changes in the amount of pesticide applied. And lastly, we review the literature on uh, carbon impact changes, but I'll talk about those more in a later slide. Next slide, please. This slide gives you an overview of the findings of the paper and the research, and I'll put it up so that you can see the summary numbers and then talk about them in more detail. Essentially over that 21 year period, the technology has been responsible for 776 million kilograms less pesticide applied to the GM crop area. That's an 8.6% reduction. But interestingly, in terms of the EIQ indicator, it is a larger benefit for the environment, equal to a 19% reduction. For the farmers who've used the technology, their incomes have increased by a total of 225 billion US dollars. The additional production coming from the technology has been equal to an extra 824 million tonnes more food fibre or feed available for consumption. And in terms of carbon emissions, I give you the 2018 figure. The technology has been responsible for a cut of 23 billion kilograms CO2 that has not been released into the atmosphere. That is equal to taking 15.3 million cars off the road for a year. Next slide, please. In terms of um, the farm income gains in 2018, the farm income gain was equal to 19 billion US dollars. To give you some context, that's roughly equal to nearly 6% of the value of the global production 
of the four main crops that the technology is used in. In terms of the average farm income gain over the period to 2018, that comes out at $97 per hectare on average. And the income share between developed and developing countries is marginally in favour of developing countries rather than developed countries. Next slide, please. Um, this slide gives you um, an overview of the average benefits by country. The key take home message from this is that the highest returns have tended to go to farmers in developing countries rather than those in developed countries. Next slide, please. Uh, in relation to the countries and who farmers have benefited most, you will see that farmers in the United States have the largest share of the cake of benefit. That is not surprising if I take you back to one of the slides in the previous presentation, which shows that the United States was amongst the first countries to widely adopt this technology and has now for nearly 20 years had adoption rates of over 90% of their entire acreage of those four crops where the technology is mainly used. You will also see important beneficiaries in South America, in Brazil and Argentina, and in China and India, because of the adoption of insect resistant cotton. Next slide, please. I think it's also important to recognize that as well as the direct quantifiable farm income benefits, there are also other reasons why farmers are using this technology. And this slide gives you an overview of some of them. Just to pick on one or two, um, the herbicide tolerant technology has increased the management flexibility or convenience to farmers in terms of how they undertake their weed control. And it's helped many farmers uh, move from a plow based to a reduced or no tillage production system. And I'll talk about that in more detail later. On the insect resistant crop size, one of the main benefits has been reducing farmers risk, or to put it another word, another way, um, they have less worry about pests destroying their crops because the technology for control is effectively in the seed. Um, and one of the benefits associated with, a, especially a crop like um, cotton, which traditionally would have been treated with insecticides numerous times, often 15 to 20 times a crop. With this technology, uh, the frequency of use of insecticides is significantly reduced, so it's only used for the control of pests that this technology does not control. So by farmers needing to use insecticides much less, it has exposed farmers and farm workers much less to insecticides and contributed to improvements in their health and safety, which has been particularly important in developing countries where often some farmers will have applied insecticides with limited use of protective clothing. Next slide, please. If there's one slide in my presentation that uh, tells you more than any other about the fundamental reason why most farmers who use this technology like it, this is the slide. If you take the net farm income gain that farmers have got and you add on the cost of the technology, you get, you get effectively the gross benefit of the technology, which is shared between farmers in terms of higher income and the supply chain that supplies the seed. That's not just the technology companies, but farmers who multiply the seed and the seed supplying com companies and the distributors. What you see from that is 
In 2018, the tech cost was equal to 27% of the total benefit. So in other words, what that means in terms of the return on investment for farmers is for every additional dollar they've spent on seed, they have got a return equal to 3.75 extra dollars in income. And that return on investment has been even better for farmers in developing countries with a return on investment equal to $4.42 per extra dollar invested in seed. So in other words, very significant and high returns on investment. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of yield versus the cost, uh, benefits, the vast majority have been derived from yield gains. The yield gains have mostly been attached to the insect resistant technology and the cost savings mostly related to the herbicide tolerant technology. Um, and the yield gains have tended to be greatest in developing countries. Next slide, please. In terms of the yield gains, this slide gives you the average yield gains related to insect resistant corn. An average across all users of 16.5%. Um, variations across country. The take home message here is the highest returns have tended to be in farmers in developing countries. Next slide will give you the same analysis for insect resistant cotton, an average gain of nearly 14%, um, and the highest yield gains again in developing countries. Next slide, please. Um, insect resistant soybeans have been available in South America since 2018 and you can see a similar pattern of yield gains, the average being just under 10%. Next slide please. Um, the herbicide tolerant traits have also had some positive impacts on yield and production and this slide just gives you an indication or a summary of where farmers have got higher yields, mostly associated with improved weed control. I won't go to it in any further detail. Next slide, please. If you then bundle up all those additional yield gains and look at it in, in an aggregate terms of extra production at a global level, this slide shows that the technology has been responsible for for example, an additional 278 million tonnes of soya beans produced over the period to 2018, and nearly 500 million tonnes more maize produced in the world. Um, nearly three, 33 million tonnes more cotton lint. And, for, and say, if the world had to produce that extra production using conventional technology, um, what additional area of conventional crop would be required to uh, be used to produce that production? And this slide gives you the equivalent figures for 2018. And what it shows is that if the world had not used GM crop technology in 2018, and it wanted to produce the extra production that the technology had delivered, the world would have required to plant an extra 24 million hectares of those four crops. To give you context, that is approximately equal to 38% of the total cropping area of Brazil. Next slide, please. To give you some focus in relation to Pakistan, where the uh, main GM crop that has been used is insect resistant cotton. It uh, has been grown widely since 2008. In 2018, was planted on virtually the entire crop. The average yield impact has been over 20%. The average farm gain, income gain, has been $223 per hectare in extra farm income. In terms of the average return on investment, 17.6 extra dollars per extra dollar spent on seed. That is some of the highest returns for any 
farming sector or crop that has used GM technology in the world. So it is not surprising that almost all of the cotton farmers in Pakistan have adopted and embraced the use of this technology. In um, aggregate terms, the farm income gains have been $5.64 billion in extra farm income, and it's contributed to an extra 3.3 million tonnes of extra cotton lint produced in Pakistan. Next slide, please. And just to give you the context of um, uh, a similar trait grown in an Asian country, um, I'm just focusing on stacked corn, herbicide tolerant and insect resistant cotton, um, corn in Vietnam. Uh, focusing on the returns on investment, you can see that significantly high returns on investment to Vietnamese farmers. Um, not quite as high as the returns in Pakistan, but nevertheless, fairly impressive performance. Next slide, please. Moving on to pesticide use. As I mentioned earlier, the technology has resulted in a significant reduction in pesticide use. To give you context, that volume of pesticide reduction is equal to 1.6 times the annual pesticide active ingredient use on crops in China. The largest gains have been associated with insect resistant cotton use, uh, where you've had approximately a, a third reduction in insecticide use and a slightly higher rate of reduction in the environmental impact as measured by the EIQ indicator. Similarly, I show you the figures for India, where the reduction in the environmental impact has been slightly higher than that. Next slide, please. In relation to greenhouse gas emissions, the technology has contributed to reducing these in two main ways, reducing fuel use for the application of uh, pesticides and less soil cultivation, as the technology has um, helped many farmers go into and adopt no tillage production practices. This has also facilitated um, through less ploughing, less soil preparation, um, less release of soil carbon from decaying plant matter that otherwise would have occurred with ploughing. Um, so you're seeing additional soil carbon storage. Next slide, please. This gives you the emission reductions figures for 2018, and you can see the vast majority of these have come from additional soil carbon retention, which is equivalent to removing 15.3 million cars from the roads for a year. To give you context, nearly equal to nearly half of the cars registered in the United Kingdom from the road for a year. If you identified the number of registered vehicles in Pakistan, you would also be able to do an equivalent figure if the data is available. Next slide, please. Um, I often get asked about the negatives. Um, you, the main one that uh, has generally been identified is how um, with the widespread adoption of herbicide tolerant technology, you had over-reliance on the use of glyphosate by some farmers, which has contributed to weed resistance problems, which resulted in farmers then having to adapt and change their weed control systems, resulting in increases in herbicide use and higher costs compared to the early years of adoption of the technology. But this needs to be put in context because weed resistant problems and increased herbicide use are also um, a problem faced by conventional farmers and have been an equal trend that has occurred in conventional crops. And if you track a comparison of changes on the GM versus the conventional crops, the environmental profile of herbicides used on the herbicide crops has continued to remain um, better than the equivalent profile on conventional crops. And as you've seen with the adoption levels, 
the herbicide tolerant crops have retained more profit remained more profitable than the conventional alternative next slide please that just gives you the summary figures again which i won't go through to and i'll just move on to my next concluding slides uh, this slide gives you an overview of the uh, overall conclusions. The impact of the insect resistant technology is mainly given farmers higher yields and has decreased insecticide use, contributed to more reliable food supplies and more env environmentally friendly farming practices. The, the herbicide tolerant technology has mainly contributed um, higher incomes and facilitated farmers moving to more sustainable no-till based production systems. Both the technologies have contributed to increase in world production of the four crops, which has resulted in less pressure to bring new land into agriculture at a global level. As in the previous presentation, we've got newer traits coming to the market in the last few years, and these are now beginning to contribute positively. Next slide, please. My last slide, your take home message I would give you is, after 23 years of widespread use, we do now have a considerable amount of consistent evidence in peer review literature on the impact of the technology. And the information I provided with you simply adds to that literature. The links there show you where you can find further information on the report I've just presented to you. The third one relates to the Vietnam study I just referred to, which has very recently been published. And I would encourage anyone watching this presentation to read these papers, these papers and the references cited in them and draw your own conclusions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brooks, for an excellent overview and, and uh, quite impressive statistics about the impact of uh, biotechnology. Now, I, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome uh, Mr. Fakhar Imam also who has uh, just joined, and he is our Federal Minister for Food Security, National Food Security and Research, and we are extremely thankful to him for uh, finding time to be with us this afternoon. I would, uh, I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the about the current status. You see, the Ram Brooks has talked about uh, the impact and the overall uh, global scenario. And earlier, uh, Ola had also uh, talked about it. And and so my my part in this is to give you a very brief current status of agricultural biotechnology in Pakistan. Actually, Pakistan had been uh, had been at it for a long time. You see, we had a, could you have the next slide, please? You see, uh, we had the, our, our elite two institutes, which, uh, which are the Center for uh, uh, Excellence, Center of Excellence in Molecular Biology and IBG, which is the national Institute for Biotechnology and Genetic Engineering uh, were established way back in 1987 and then became functional in early early, early 90s. And then uh, the government of Pakistan, the different governments of Pakistan have been investing fairly liberally in developing the infrastructure of biotechnology in, in the country. And subsequently, over the years, we have seen a plethora of institutes, biotechnology institutes, departments, virtually in every university. And to give you a count, we have a 53 such institutes or departments currently working around the country. And they are all over the country, starting from um, Gilgit, Baltistan, to, to down south in Karachi, you see. So they are spread all over the country. And, uh, and, and, and to fund their research, there are uh, only four major funding agencies in the country which have been supporting uh, uh, biotechnology to some extent, you see. And these funding agencies are, could I have the next slide, please? 
is our uh, only i mean uh, agriculture heritage program of the pakistan agriculture research council and then national program uh, for university it is the hcc funded uh, activity and then we have another one with the pakistan science foundation which is the natural science thinkages program and then we have a very robust punjab agriculture research board which supports agriculture research in punjab but other three support all over the country and and i am only giving you the funding which is ongoing you see i mean it is not old it is it is the current funding that you can see that the government has been spending uh, a fairly good money on uh, the agriculture research you see and these are i have recently compiled the uh, status of agriculture biotechnology in pakistan and i have documented all institutes and all uh, research projects being currently conducted in pakistan and then this is uh, the the objective of this uh, webinar is also to showcase that we have the technology we have the expertise at the moment but somehow this expertise is not being uh, utilized for any translational activities you see in other words i mean uh, the part of commercialization or part of bringing all that into the field is uh, if we face some bottlenecks which we would like to identify and we would like uh, uh, to overcome those you see could i have the next slide please this is a this of not all but some of the important centers of uh, uh, where uh, cutting edge work on plant biotechnology or crop biotechnology or agricultural biotechnology is being carried out and these you can see are spread over all the whole of the country you see you know do you have the next slide please now i mean most important is that the all this transgenic research is going on on all important economic crops of the country you see you know and then this i have just tried to test cotton sugarcane wheat chickpea and and others uh, and and uh, on all aspects you see of insect resistance cotton leaf curl drought stress biopesticides etc and in wheat i mean uh, cotton and wheat are the two major crops where thought of Uh, uh, biotechnological activity based on uh, genetic modification gm crops uh, is 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 going on and with lot of success you see and we can say that we are as far as the research is concerned the second to none anywhere you see but somehow we have our problems of the of the regulation you see we are uh, stuck in the totally non scientific basis of our the regulation you see and then is we uh, i'm happy that dr that so fakhri imam is here i would like to to apprise him also and and get his help could i have the next slide please oh, this is the contribution of that that uh, rice maize sunflower mustard potato all crops you see i have tested all the such groups which are working on all these crops in in different parts of the of the country you see you know so so we have activity going on in every crop and 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 some departments of the ministry even uh, and environment you know have have to say that we are a gm free country you see i i it is amazing you see but anyway could i have the next slide please well this is also you know some of the the gums and then also in addition to transgenic research in plants we have a very active uh, groups working on uh, the production of bio fertilizers biogas bio diesel bio fuel also could i have the next slide please well uh, the private sector the most interesting uh, development which has happened in pakistan is that the private sector is coming up very fast uh, i mean in in developing biotechnology and some of the laboratories have some of the industry has developed their own research labs and they are doing virtually cutting edge research also and so this is a very good uh, uh, development and we should 
try to support it try to collaborate you know now the the, the private sector and the public sector organizations are can be on equal footing and can easily talk to each other can easily exchange their expertise in the private sector you see and similarly a buyer now which is uh, the, the, i think monsanto has been taken over by buyer and got eva agri science which are huge big agri science companies multinationals i think we have to you know uh, uh, i mean develop an environment whereby uh, these mncs can also to take part in the development of the country we have the next slide please if if there is one well this is the same as i was saying that there are the good atri processes i mean national biosafety the committees or center is now under the is not now but has always been under uh, the epa under the park epa and uh, and and they still have a lot of lack of capacity they still do not have enough manpower and and uh, and they keep on holding meetings sometimes but they are more con uh, concentrated on cotton you see they don't uh, i mean uh, i mean, haven't done any work for the other crops you see and effort there is an urgent need for deep visiting the biosafety guidelines in the country and you know th this is a good statement that if over agitation can be avoided gm technology have the potential to increase productivity as well as the nutritional value of of crops you see this can be virtually a game changer you see i mean if if our policy makers uh, can understand that you see you know i mean uh, uh, what is the objective of regulation the objective is to have a safe and Uh, 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 safe food for our people, and if that can be ensured, then what is the purpose of over regulation? You see, could I have the next slide, please? Well, this is you know this is an uh, you know we have that the NBC has allowed uh, the uh, laboratory genetic manipulation perk. Uh, in 48 applications and field trials for 121 applications all this is uh, concerned i mean all the voluntary genetic manipulation and field trials are still i mean many of it has not ended up into commercialization the only commercialization cases are of cotton you see and 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 and, and there also the big problems are the the quality of that uh, commercialized seed you see you know because the the expression of et is very variable and we have problems with the seed industry and also with the federal seed certification uh, activity also you know so so there is a need to to deep is it all these guidelines both in the biosafety and also at the federal seed certification and the seed industry has to be you know we have been trying to the model it for, for a long time but somehow we have have not succeeded could i have the next slide please if there is any no thank you so much and uh, uh, this was uh, my submission and uh, we have to move on to our ex speaker who is a very well known researcher and uh, uh, director of the national institute for biotechnology and genetic engineering he is a fellow of the pakistan academy of sciences and also satara imtiaz and has been recognized quite well and uh, we would request him to uh, to talk about the biotech crop adoption and acceptance in pakistan shahid mansoor uh, dr kosar uh thank you very much for, for giving me this opportunity so i i hope that somebody will uh, is going to uh, show the slides or should i share the screen if you can share the screen sir so that you can control it okay <clears throat> nay the, the slides have already been sent to you yes all these slides yes sir so if you could send uh -oh. that okay 
So whatever you like, you know, I, I can play from here. Can you see okay. my? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Uh, please uh, make a slideshow. There. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to control, or you? You will. You you okay. shared it. So thank sir. you very much for for giving me this opportunity, and uh, and also, I think that you know uh, I have some. Uh, my talk is mostly on uh, success and and failure stories in Pakistan. So uh, as we say that just to uh, um, give you a glimpse of the uh, agriculture in Pakistan. So in agricultural dynamics, we have been able to feed our population and we are self-sufficient in cereals, but we are importer of uh, many uh, commodities like edible oil, pulses, cotton, uh, tea, dry milk. But, but now we, we are talking more about the nutritional uh, uh, value of the food. So this is an important area that you know, our food is deficient in some of the essential nutrients and uh, which include vitamins and minerals, including iron. Uh, we are facing many challenges, uh, population, water, climate change, land, pestilence, diseases, salinity. So obviously these are challenges that we need disruptive technologies to feed the growing population. Uh, there are many uh, possible solutions and uh, uh, one of them is management. So we obviously, you know, management is very important. And uh, so, uh, but there's a cost involved, for example, if you know, if you want to bring new technologies for uh, irrigation, you, 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 we have to invest a lot. But whereas on the other hand, if we work on genetic gain, then this is something which has more capital of knowledge, but less capital is intensive in terms of, uh, so we have, the, as Dr. Kosser has pointed out, we have the infrastructure, we have the scientific manpower, and because of the very uh, liberal funding by Higher Education Commission, a lot of very talented scientists have joined Pakistan in different universities and research institutions. Uh, so what is, uh, we, we propose is that you know we, we work towards genetic gain by in, in, uh, adopting the disruptive technologies, including biotechnology. So the, the, the success story, as Dr. Koster mentioned, <coughs> that the one of the success stories that we have in this country, and I'm taking examples from NIBGI, uh, is the adoption of BT cotton. Uh, and this is this came, and uh, Dr. Uh, other speaker from UK has also pointed out that you know there's a major benefit which has gone into uh, uh, to the farmers, and we have uh, evidence that you know this has decreased the increase the use of uh, pesticide in Pakistan. But, but uh, uh, we were uh, mostly using a single gene cryonase, uh, and uh, but we have other problem like you know pink bollworm, which has emerged as one of the major issues then arbimum and, and also weeds. Uh, there's a uh, growing, uh, because of the climate change, you know, uh, weeds is becoming problem. And especially, you know, the, the, the cost of labor is increasing in Pakistan. So what we have done in many institutions in Pakistan, including NIBGI is that, you know, they have stacked the gene. Uh, include, so, I mean, in, instead of one gene, we are now using BT cotton with double gene and, and, uh, and also, uh, the uh, because uh, the first thing that we, we established is that you know we have developed resistance against pink bollworm by looking at the mutation at Kajarin gene and we found that you know this as daily we have the evidence that you know we have so we need uh, the technology but the good thing is that when we have combination of cry one ac and cry 2 ab which are two different uh, bt gene we have better uh, control of uh, pink bollworm in the field and uh, the material with, with the uh, double and triple gene has been shared with breeders. And this uh, material is now available in our field. We have several thousand plants tested under field conditions and uh, we have identified multiple uh, uh, cotton with multiple genes. There's also a, a combination of uh, uh, BT genes with uh, herbicide tolerance gene. And, uh, and we have also developed some, some of the mutants of the cry one ac gene to overcome the issue of uh, developing resistance against uh, cry one ac in, uh, in pink bollworm. So 
uh, as Dr. Gossam mentioned that, you know, we, this, the institution that we have in Pakistan, they have, they have been able to develop uh, indigenous sources of resistance. And also one of the important thing is that, you know, the, the event characterization. So if you have claimed for a gene, uh, the, 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 the gene plus we need uh, where the gene has landed in the chromosome. So we have identified for our double gene and triple gene and we have found a uh, file patent on these uh, events. Now, there are some of the uh, uh, success, success stories. Uh, beside cotton, uh, there is also a success story, which is the import of GM soybean and canola as grain. And this has came uh, very interesting because of the import of uh, uh, canola uh, as, as a grain for uh, crushing. And there was a capacity enhancement of solvent uh, industry in Pakistan. And because of this success, uh, we have uh, replaced imported soybean meal with, with our own produced meal, which is a fairly a good contribution uh, uh, to the economy. But also we have failure. I mean, one of the failure was that, you know, we, uh, the government of Pakistan allowed to do uh, trials for for uh, GM corn, uh, especially in terms of uh, recent uh, outbreak of fall armyworm, we very much required this technology, but uh, somehow you know the the, the 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 permission was not given for commercialization, which could have benefited, especially in in view of the emerging issues of uh, fall armyworm in the country, on 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 corn. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm just giving you a, the right from the start, you know, we started, there was, when we started to have a, you know, kind of a discussion that, you know, uh, and uh, exciting era of uh, biotech crop in Pakistan. So at that time, we started with GM rice because the, the, the genes for bacterial bite x 21 was available from Rockefeller, the cost was instrument in bringing that gene and then BT rice, CMB developed BT rice. And, and then we, this was before the uh, biosafety laws and, but uh, obviously, you know, because of the, our major share in, in uh, rice export, we were not given the permission to commercialize, but at least that, that provided us with the, with the um, confidence that, you know, we can develop and, uh, uh, transgenic crops in Pakistan. Now, there's another uh, very interesting case, which was uh, uh, drought tolerant and salinity tolerant uh, corn. So as Dr. Kossar has mentioned that, you know, in Pakistan, uh, there's a heavy investment on biotechnology in wheat. The first thing was that we established a system for regeneration of our varieties, which was a major breakthrough. And we developed, this was all uh, drought tolerant and salinity tolerant uh, wheat was uh, funded by Punjab Agriculture Research Board. But very interesting was that, you know, when we were doing field trials, there was a uh, objection from CIMIT. And they said, you know, you are growing wheat uh, in the field. And, you know, so, I mean, this was a very uh, surprising that, you know, an international organization like CIMIT would promote science. They were against the trials of uh, biotech wheat in Pakistan. So we will be sure that, uh, that uh, because uh, trans, uh, that, you know, there's a major gain in yield which came from the, uh, because of the uh, 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 gain in the, in the uh, thousand weight uh, grain uh, 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 in these uh, GM wheat. But nevertheless, uh, these, uh, weeds are still waiting to be commercialized. Uh, and uh, we showed that, you know, if we commercialize this drought tolerant and salinity tolerant wheat, we could actually, you know, gain some very important gains. Uh, there's another story of a transgenic crop, which is sugarcane. And this was again funded by Punjab Agriculture Research Board. And uh, the idea was that to, to develop drought, salt, and frost tolerant sugarcane. And uh, this has been uh, tried. And uh, so at least in this area, this uh, sugarcane, we, we have got uh, permission recently from our uh, 
regulators that you know we can do field trials i don't know what will happens to the commercialization of uh, transgenic sugar cane uh, so th there are many challenges uh, in in and uh, commercialization of uh, gm crops in pakistan the the perception which is coming from uh, you know outside pakistan is influencing uh, pakistan so we always have the yes and no question or answer that you know whether we are going to so there are many uh, other avenues that we are uh, we have like you know we need to definitely uh, make the our policy make, maker understand you know what are the benefits so i think this uh, seminar like this is very useful but also there is a wonderful progress uh, amazing progress made in genomics so genomic assisted breeding is another and, and new breeding technologies so uh, there are many new breeding technologies including but the most important thing is the crispr uh, which has revolutionized the the way that we can uh change uh, the genome is so is, is is we also call them as uh, genome editing technologies and they allow us to modify a gene without inserting a gene or or maybe in in some cases we can have a very uh, site specific uh, insertion of the gene as well so mostly uh, most of the work on new breeding technology is considered as non gmo Uh, we had a session at nibdi uh, how to regulate these crops and trades in pakistan so uh, there are a uh, uh, lot of opportunities for pakistan uh, especially in uh, uh, grain crops where we have we have, we have limited limitation because of the acceptability of uh, gm technology uh so there are many groups who have now started work on but uh, at nibdi we are working mostly on rice uh, uh like you know herbis uh, uh, herbicide tolerance and uh, then bacterial bite resistance by just mutating one or two gene potato wheat and cotton and i think that there's a lot of opportunity for pakistan so so the take home message for 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 today is that the rate of genetic gain is slow in pakistan so we need disruptive technologies like uh, new breeding technologies and and gm technologies uh, so far uh, uh, around the world and in pakistan acceptability acceptability of gm crops is limited to fiber oil and sugarcane as i said that you know in in case of oil the most of the uh, uh, almost all of the soybean oil and canola which we are using is is all gm uh, sugar crop is uh, is uh, is another area where we think that you know the approval should be easier but also we have new breeding technologies offer uh, transgene free genetic gain uh, so there's a lot of investment in recent time in recent in 2 3 years and especially by award of uh, uh, um nobel prize to Jennifer Durna this year, so I think that you know there's a lot of awareness about the the importance of these new technologies. Uh, so we, uh, so far we have GM cotton with multiple traits, canola and sugarcane. Uh, so we think that genomic selection uh, by using uh, genomic technologies and can be coupled with speeding technologies. So instead of uh, spending seven or eight years, we can now uh develop varieties in 3 to 4 years uh and there's also uh quite robust uh, progress in made in uh, genome editing of rice potato wheat and i think that you know uh, as i said earlier that uh, the kind of infrastructure the kind of uh, manpower that we have in country uh, it is second to none we have uh, uh work in different variety uh, labs around the world in both in europe and in us and uh, i assure my colleagues and students that you know uh we have the kind of manpower which is available in pakistan is available so the only thing is that you know we need to prioritize our trades and and then you know instead of just following the rut uh, we need uh, more approval so that uh, our workers who have worked very hard for many years get some reward thank you very much thank you thank you shayad for a very exciting
presentation and uh, we have now to move on to the actual stakeholder you see you know the actual uh, person or the group who, for whom we all are working you see and I would request Dr. Zafar Ayat who is himself a, he is a medical doctor but he himself a very keen progressive farmer and also the resident of uh, Farmers Bureau, Pakistan. He has been uh, uh, planting cotton and maize crop in the country for a long time, and he has a good experience. And uh, I mean, he can tell us many things that we do not know. Over to you, Dr. Zafar Yatsa. Uh, how much time do I have? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, right. Thank you very much. I'm in a shaitan or regime. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, first of all, um, uh, whatever I'm going to share, uh, the views which I'm going to share are uh, the views uh, which are shared by the majority of the farmers. And of course, some may differ and the main reasons for the difference in the opinion is based on the knowledge we get, whether that knowledge is authentic or unauthentic. Uh, now, as far as the first of all, can, can we move to the next slide, please? As far as the adoption of technologies is concerned by the farmers, uh, I can assure you that the Pakistani farmers have been very receptive in adopting uh, the technologies whenever they have been introduced, provided that those technologies have proved to be uh, increasing the productivity and the income of the farmer. Uh, we can uh, go back and we see that when there was mechanization, when there was introduction of the hybrid seeds, uh, when there was introduction of the uh, other, uh, uh, other technologies related to improved agricultural practices, farmers, they were always very receptive as far as their adoption was concerned. Now, the uh, coming to the topic, which is uh, how and what are the opinion about, of the farmers regarding the GM technology, uh, I would uh, start with the cotton because uh, the experience of uh, genetically modified technology uh, uh, in Pakistan is concerned, it has been based on the experience which we had regarding the cotton crop. Uh, to give you a brief, uh, a brief tea, because I, I started myself, I started uh, practicing farming in 1992, and uh, we saw that uh, in 1996, the world started uh, showing the uh, GMIR technology around the world, starting from the US. Uh, we saw that uh, the technology entered into the country on a mass level, somewhere in mid-2000. Uh, but the crop was there. Uh, the, the introduction of the technology started somewhere in late 90s and early 200s, 2000. The productivity went up, as it was pointed out by one of the uh, scientists, that the productivity or the income of the farmers, it increased. Yes, it did in the beginning. And it was, uh, it showed a very good result, uh, so much so that the farmers, they very quickly started adopting it. Uh, we saw uh, that the, uh, yeah, the sowing, and that, that uh, changed many practices also along with it. Uh, what we saw was that because now farmers, they were more comfortable with the certain insects which are creating uh, havoc, uh, which was the hideothus and the spotted and the pink bullworm. So when they saw that they have the variety which is showing resistance to these uh, different bullworms, what they did was that they changed the, uh, the sowing uh, window. The typical sowing window was somewhere from end of April to start of June. This was the conventional or traditional sowing period which we were using for sowing our uh, cotton crop. Because now we were seeing that uh, we can uh, 
move it to the earlier uh, uh, period also. So what we farmers did was that we started sowing it from late February and up till the first uh, week of June. Now, this brought certain changes in the pest system uh, or, or in the pest scenario, you can say. Uh, we saw that there were certain pests which were never considered to be the threatening pests for the cotton started emerging, like mealybug and the dus dusky bug. Now, the people, what, what basically, this was the first time when our uh, confidence regarding Bt gene or Bt cotton was shattered. Uh, because uh, whatever, I, whatever I am saying is not what I feel or what I, I saw it. But what farmers actually perceive, that is what I am basically sharing. So the farmers thought that maybe it is, has something to do with the uh, GM uh, technology. Uh, well, later on, um, uh, we saw that uh, regulators they started coming in. And uh, we can, can we move to the next slide also, please? Yeah. Now, if we see, that's what I'm saying. The pest scenario started changing. That is the, uh, there, there was uh, pest resistance we saw. There was new pest, millibug and dusky bug. And we saw that there were outbreaks of uh, heliothus. And we saw resistance against the pink. These things started raising the questions in the minds of the farmers that what was, uh, maybe there is something wrong with the GM cotton. And... Now, what happened? Now, where do we stand as far as the cotton is concerned uh, and as far as the GMIR cotton is concerned? Currently, over the period of time, what we have seen is that there has been up and down in the productive, national productivity of the cotton. And from last three years, we have seen that the national productivity of cotton is going down. This year, maybe it will go to the uh, six or seven million bills. And the, now what we have is that we have now stable seed varieties against the heliothus. We have stable seed varieties against the spotted, complete resistance against the pink, and uh, susceptibility of the cotton crop has increased to the sucking pests. So currently, if, where do we stand in GM cotton now? That the, cot, the seed is there. It is a GM seed. But this GM seed is not performing against pink bollworm. Sometimes we see outbreaks of heliothus and we see high susceptibility to the sucking pest. Uh, though one of the scientists do said that this has increased the uh, uh, income of the uh, cotton farmers, uh, maybe this has done in the past. But if you come to the current scenario that it you talk about 2019, 2020, 18, we have seen that the income of the cotton farmers, they have gone down. We cannot attribute all solely to the GM technology. Of course, it has more to do with the seed, seed varieties than maybe the GM technology. Of course, with the GM technology also because the way it was handled. Next slide, please. Now, basically what went wrong with GM cotton? Uh, the scientists are here, they know that the GM cotton seed was introduced in late 90s in Pakistan, though it was not commercial at that time. And uh, whatever was the uh, source, one thing was very clear, that the seed which came and which the trials which started showed a drastic failure. And the reason was that the varieties which they brought or the seed which they brought was not... Uh, uh, show uh, could not adopt to the to the environment which Pakistan had. So what they started doing was then they started crossing it maybe, and ultimately was we saw seed uh, which was brought into Pakistan somewhere in mid two thousands, and this was a seed again which was not produced. I think the commercial variety which was introduced and which was highly uh, adapted or or shown on the area was basically not. Indigenous, indigenously produced. At that time, we saw that because when I, I believe this is the scenario which was basically at that time, that government has to come in and, and quickly come up with the regulatory uh, framework, which was biosafety rules, biosafety guidelines, and knowing that the whole of our cotton economy may be affected if this keeps on going. So it was better to make 
the things legal and illegal uh, entry of this technology. But all this happened a bit late, I think. This, the, the time which government took was so, uh, whatever, definitely there must have been some reasons behind it, some, some technical reasons behind it, maybe some of the uh, resources which were needed at that time, maybe those were the reasons, but whatever the reasons were, we were a bit late in the reaction. And till the time we were fully uh, uh, into it, we saw that we had mishandled this technology. And uh, this mishandling ultimately led to the varieties which were actually not fit for the country eco or uh, ecological system or the environment. And that is why we saw that the cotton could not perform. At the same time, what happened was that uh, certain myths, they were created because these myths were actually confusing the farmers. And some of these myths, they were also coming from the scientific circle. So if the myths are coming from the sources which are not reliable, those myths, they die out very quickly. But if they are coming from the scientific circle, that basically uh, creates certain kind of uncertainty or uh, loses its, uh, the farmers or the stakeholder loses the confidence in that technology. The myths like that GM crops may be carcinogenic. The myths like uh, that it ruins the seed quality. We saw that uh, our seed germination went down to 50%, 60%. And many of the scientific circles that attributed this to the, uh, the BT gene itself. Then there was also another myth that it may be toxic. It may carry certain toxic material which can harm the humans and which can harm the animals which are being fed on the, the, uh, on the residues or on the byproducts of the, uh, of the cotton and other things. Then there was a myth that it contains a termination gene, which means that if farmers, they are going to allow it to uh, take its market share, ultimately they will have the seed which cannot grow in the next season. And uh, the normal practice of farmer sharing their seed would be that that could not happen. There was uh, the, one of the biggest myth, I think, uh, which was there that it will create a monopoly. There will be few countries or few companies who would be controlling it. Now, I call it myth because this is not proven by any scientific data. And many of the progressive farmers, they know that uh, this is uh, basically not uh, supported uh, by the scientific uh, data. Next slide, please. That should be my uh, last slide. Yes, this can be a uh, last slide. Uh, this can be current view of the farmers. You can say this is the, as uh, many scientists are saying that uh, take home message. I believe, and this is what majority of farmers, the farming community is going to, uh, will endorse this. All, I think all the farmers bodies, they are going to endorse this. We are ready for any technology which increases the farmer's productivity, which increases the farmer's economics, which improves its rates of return. If these things are there, farmer would be very uh, happy to welcome all those technologies. But at the same time, because this is something which is genetically uh, modifying uh, technology. So we also say that it should be safe for the environment. And who is going to uh, basically do this? This has to be uh, backed by the scientists. It should have a scientific backing. It should be based on pure scientific uh, or pure scientific uh, you can say uh, proofs and mm, last not to this because if we have productivity if it is safe as far as the environment is concerned and it if even if it is backed by the scientists if the produce is not marketable then again the farmers would be reluctant so if any technology is going to ful fulfill these criteria i'm 100% sure the farmers would be ready to uh, adopt uh, this technology. At the end, because uh, our worthy minister is also here and he himself is the farmer, 
and um, definitely in his leadership we are going we are expecting that there will be positive uh, agricultural policies which be coming soon inshallah the point which i want to share here is that it is very important that regulatory bodies should play their role based on pure scientific uh, uh, knowledge be it scientific uh, uh, on the science basis they should be playing their role on the science it is the work of the, the work of the agriculture uh, of the uh, agriculture uh, ministry or or the uh, or you can say the consumers who ultimately decide whether this uh, kind of a technology is uh, they are going to accept the products which are going to be released from these thus the things where the approvals goes on it should be totally based on science thank you very much everybody um, i hope i have uh, uh, tried to convey uh, the farmer's view uh, in a in a in a way that uh, it is easily understood uh, once again dr kosto thank you very much thank you so much dr zafarayat sir it was uh, very informative and uh, we now move on to our next session where we have uh, discussion from the participants and if they have any questions i think i will uh, hand over to Dr. Ikrare Khan Sab, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Agriculture, Pakistan. He himself is a well-renowned scientist. He, he is also a fellow of the uh, Pakistan Academy of Sciences and a founder uh, of the Center for Agricultural Biochemistry and Biotechnology, in addition to the Center for Food Security and Agriculture, which he um, managed to establish there. And so, we are so happy to have him here. He, he was also awarded the Sitara Imtiaz by the President of Pakistan about a few years back. So I hand over to Dr. Ikrari Khan sahab. Thank you, uh, Balak Sahib. And also, I'm very happy to be here, part of this uh, August gathering. Uh, I've uh, listened to all uh, presentations and uh, it was a very uh, enlightening experience. I missed out a little bit at the end of uh, Shahad Mansoor's talk and uh, beginning of uh, Dr. Zafar Hiyad, but the message is there. I've also looked through the chat and the Q&A boxes, and most of the questions which were raised, they were simultaneously answered. For example, uh, uh, at the very outset, there was a question that uh, why uh, GM crops are not uh, accepted in UK and EU. And uh, uh, Graham Brooks can probably answer that question. Other than that, CRISPR Cas was raised, and uh, Shahad has uh, uh, shed some light on CRISPR Cas. He has also given the verdict that CRISPR Cas is not uh, GM. Uh, so this can be discussed further if it is to be uh, labeled as GM or not. There was a student's question that. Uh, uh, what are the options uh, for future uh, transformation uh, of uh, wheat and rice uh, for us particularly? And then uh, uh, a question again from a student, uh, biotechnology and grass science improvement, grasses. I believe uh, someone is talking about rangeland grasses, uh, or I don't know if it is golf course grasses, but... Uh, uh, grass, grass sciences itself a very well established field. Our, our own Dr. Somro has raised the question uh, for Dr. Graham Brooks that what is the net profit? Is it uh, increased with the application of GM crops or net profit has not increased? He believes that probably the cost has also gone up. Uh, I would ask uh, Dr. Graham to uh, maybe take up this question. Uh, two questions from Aslam Bhatti. Uh, Bhatti Saab, uh, you know, has worked with uh, these uh, MNCs and I suppose he is still very much engaged. He thinks that uh, the views of Dr. Brooks and Dr. Malak are contradictory. Uh, he, he, he takes uh, the cue from uh, uh, Dr. Brooks saying that Pakistan has benefited tremendously. Uh, and uh, Dr. Malik has also told us that there are issues and uh, uh, the issues raised by Malik Saab were also validated by uh, Dr. Zafar Hayat. And then 
uh, there is question from uh, our comment actually from Zagam Habib. He says that uh, BT has failed because it has very long duration. It requires uh, a very high input, and uh, high input basically makes it, uh, uh, you know, cost ineffective. These are, of course, uh, personal views. Uh, to me, uh, the take-home message still is that we have failed to regulate it. We are trying to over-regulate it. There has to be some mechanism of third-party validation of uh, the claims and uh, trying to make the things simpler. And that reminds me, when I started working for Pakistan Autonomy Commission, Malik Saab was my boss, and he sent me to Environment Ministry to attend a meeting of uh, uh, Biosafety Committee or something like that. And I believe that they are still there where they were in 2005. Nothing has changed. So the scientific uh, discovery and uh, effort has been largely wasted. Dr. Malik has rightly pointed out that we have huge resource, uh, the institutions, uh, the competent uh, scientific community, but uh, uh, they are uh, kind of uh, uh, desperate that they are unable to uh, uh, make their discoveries uh, translated into goods and services. Uh, so with these uh, few uh, observations, I would like to go back to Dr. Graham and uh, tell us uh, what is the story with UK and EU. And then uh, he may also try to answer Dr. Somro if the net profits were also in favor of adoption. Yeah, sure. Um, let's try and talk about um, the EU and the UK first. Um, Firstly, the EU, there are, there is a GM crop grown in the European Union. There's an insect resistant maize that's been grown since 1998. It's the only one that's really ever been approved and it's widely grown in Spain and Portugal. But yes, the European Union has fundamentally, um, the Political parties in many member states have taken a, a fairly negative view towards the technology. And whilst the scientific regulatory body known as the European Food Safety Agency has generally concurred with regulators around the world in terms of safety um, of the technology, the politicians have then tended to not want to allow the European farmers to use the technology or the citizens to benefit from it uh, for non-science and non-evidence-based um, reasons. Um, and I don't know whether it will have escaped your notice that um, at, this is a very appropriate time this week in that we have European politicians queuing up all over the place to extol the virtues of the science and the development of GM-based vaccines for COVID-19. And you just watch how quickly they will go through the regulatory process in Europe for approval. And that is going to be actually by the very same politicians who've spent the last 25 years ignoring the science in relation to the use of this same technology in agriculture. So I think that is a, a, a very important point to recognize the sheer inconsistency and hypocrisy of many politicians in the European Union. In respect to the United Kingdom, we are leaving the European Union in six weeks time. Um, the UK is then free to decide what it wants to do in relation to the regulation of this technology. Um, and early signals are that the government is likely to take a less anti-science basis than the European Union. Um, I personally expect that it will continue to use the EU's regulation, regulatory basis for GM crops. Um, but seek to apply the regulations as they were originally supposed to be applied on the basis of science, and that the, Europe, the UK will also not classify 
gene edited crops in the same way that the European um, Union did. So whilst the European Union through the European court case um, that was bought um, 2018 decided that any product from gene editing should be classified as a GM, I suspect that the UK may not adopt that policy, but we remain, it remains to be seen. And e even if they do have a more positive attitude, you may see GM crops ultimately, or gene edited crops grown in the United Kingdom, but you're not gonna see them for many years because of the processes by which you've got to encourage companies to come to the market, to go through the regulatory process, and ultimately bring the technology to the market. So I think you will see a more positive attitude, but um, it will take time. Um, you asked me about some of the other questions. Um, the question about net profit, I mean, what I would say is the analysis that we are drawing on, the analysis that most people do, looks at the change in the income from um, using the technology. So from that extent, um, the analysis shows how it improves farmer incomes. And then my data that in our report is net changes in the farm income after you've taken into consideration the extra price that farmers pay for the technology. Um, I, you, you may recall the return on investment figures I was presenting in my presentation. So the, the analysis data does show to a certain extent the impact on net profit, but I acknowledge that the specific impact on net profit will vary at the farm level. So if you're a farmer who was making a profit from growing cotton, growing conventional cotton, the technology will have improved the level of profitability. For a farmer who was making a loss, it may have moved him into profit. For a farmer who's making a hell of a large loss, it may have never brought him into profit, in which case they would have probably not grown cotton. Um, the issue that um, has been interestingly raised about um, apparent or perceptions of failure of the technology, I think the last presentation highlighted a number of very relevant and poignant issues and what they really boil down to is where there are problems affecting the growing of a crop. And it doesn't just have to be um, cotton in Pakistan or cotton in any country. It applies to any crop. It's that there are a multitude of issues and impacts on the, pro the productivity and profitability of growing a crop. Um, and it's how these have impacted on the GM cotton that's affected the profitability. The technology, for example, controls a number of pests. There are a number of other pests that the technology doesn't control. Because farmers moved to planting earlier, those pests became more prominent, but many farmers have perceived the problem has been associated with the technology. And your last speaker very nicely discussed that in his presentation. So I, I would argue that it, isn't, it hasn't been a failure of the technology. The technology has delivered benefits, but the apparent failures are associated with other factors which affect the growing of the crop. And these would probably have been worse if they hadn't have had access to this technology. It's the same with yields. If your Pakistan yields of cotton have fallen in the last two or three years, they are primarily due to a, a multitude of factors of which one of the major ones I assume in your country is the timing and frequency of the monsoon. Um, so if you hadn't have had this technology, the yield fall off would probably have been even greater. And the la lastly, um, to the person who asked the question about was my presentation contradictory with somebody else's, 
I would say, well, no, not really, because I was talking about the use of the technology in relation to cotton, and he was really talking about the potential use of the technology in a number of other crops which have not yet been brought to market for various reasons, such as um, regulatory approval issues and whether the the developers of the technology have decided whether they really want to bring the technology to the market or not. Anyway, I think I've tried to respond to most of the questions you asked me to, but if not, please come back to me again. You have, you have replied them very well, sir. I'm extremely happy that you have taken every bit of question I raised. Uh, anybody else wants to comment on the uh, the description or the reply sent by Dr. Brooks. Malak Sahib, do you want to say Yes, I think I would also like to welcome uh, Dr. Michael Jones from Australia. From yeah. uh, you know, He had joined and he had uh, very important uh, uh, inputs. Right. Yes. Right. And, uh, uh, he also mentioned that uh, uh, the genome editing technology has been cleared in Australia at least, you see. If, if, if not in EU, the, the, it, is, it is no more considered as a GM, you see, you know. But apart from that, I think, uh, you know, if, if there are no more questions, then we would like to invite uh, Mr. Fakhar Imam Saab for his comments. Uh -huh. Malsa, uh, Michael Jones has uh, made two more comments. He has said that uh, one of the reasons for failure of your cotton BT applications is uh, non-compliance of refugia. That you, yes. have never bothered, you have never bothered to create a refuge. Yes. And second, secondly, he has uh, suggested that your best option to use genome editing would be wheat to break the yield stagnation. Yes, that's right. I read those, you see, you know. Okay. Yes, okay. Um, so, um, Imam Tab, we yeah. request you to give your comments, please. Thank you. Uh, thank. <laughs> thank you very much, Ji. Assalamualaikum. I'm grateful to Doctor. Professor Abdullah Malik Saab, and to welcoming uh, Dr. Iqrar Saab, Dr. Shahid Mansour Saab, Honorable Anita, uh, Director, who spoke, I didn't hear because I was a little late, and Honorable Graham Brooks, whose uh, concluding remarks I just heard. Dr. Zafar Ayat Saab, who spoke on behalf of the growers, farmers community of Pakistan. I was pleased to hear all of them. Fagar sahab, apni, apni, apni mic pass kar lena, to it, aapke awaz peter a jayegi. Ji. Ji, uh, it's better, sir. It's better. Uh, I was just saying that I'm um, grateful to Dr. Khalid Kullah Malik sahab, Dr. Ikrar sahab, and Dr. Shahid. Mansoor Saab, Dr. Zafariyat Saab, and the honorable uh, colleagues, uh, one from Britain, Mr. Brooks, uh, Dr. Aldemita from the SC Asia Center, director, whose talk unfortunately I didn't hear because we were not uh, able to access the link at the time. Nevertheless, I have benefited greatly. I have been on this job for the last five, six months. Uh, on national food security. Um, as you just said that GMO technology is uh, something which has greatly impacted uh, some very major countries. The exception being Europe or European Union as just was stated that other than Spain and possibly Portugal, they are not growing GMO crops directly in Europe and there seems to be some kind of a philosophic uh, preservation, if I may use that word, because as has been consistently said, that scientists base everything on observation, evidence, and hence basing it on observation and evidence, they come up with their own conclusions. Uh, 
And as the honorable uh, gentleman just mentioned that now that COVID-19 vaccine is required, they are willing to accept this methodology, even though they may not accept it uh, for crops or animals. So we have to wait and see as and when they do adopt that. Uh, I think one of the areas of Pakistan, of course, has been in this game formally or informally for the last two decades. And one crop where we have had this uh, DNA in our uh, crops is that of cotton. And the real um, problem that has arisen in cotton, and as all of you have said in the last three years, the cotton production has really gone down. And this year is going to go down even worse because of the large scale change of climate, primarily in the south. Sindh has never had such high precipitation for the last 100 years. Since the records in Sindh were maintained on rainfall, all records were broken this year and possibly one third of that crop has been almost totally wiped out because of the standing water in the cotton fields. Uh, similarly, in South Punjab, uh, although the cotton was not on that large scale, but it came at the peak of the season in September for three, four consecutive days. There were three or four consecutive days of rainfall also, highly affecting the uh, production of cotton. Hence, the last figure we had two weeks back, 31st of October, which is given by the Pakistan Cotton Genesis Association, our cotton production <laughs> as compared to last year, which was not a high mark at all, is 42, 43% less. So this year, our cotton is likely to be lower than the last three decades. Uh, it's really a, going to be a very major task to try and promote and encourage uh, cotton farmers to even uh, grow cotton when they have other options available to them. But getting back to the biotech uh, crops in Pakistan, we failed, I think, in a way to evolve the regulations by law. As, as my um, information is in those two laws that were pending for several years, but passed, I think, in three, four years back, which gave uh, adequate protection to those who would evolve these varieties. Hence, I think now that they may be in position, but yet, uh, unless and until, and now we see, and as Dr. Khosr Abdullah Saab said, that we have these four uh, basic uh, institutions, one of them which he headed himself earlier, and then three others of distinction in about 51, 52, uh, biotechnology institutions or departments spread all over the country. And they are now experimenting, examining how uh, to evolve and uh, bring about some kind of uh, gene addition, as you call it, or uh, change in the basic uh, genetic outcome of these uh, crops. However, I think, uh, are we in, uh, we, what we really have to convince ourselves of is the ultimate safety of all humans and uh, animals, the environment, how it will impact on, on the uh, general uh, population of our country, um, the impact, the global impact it will have on the environment, on the economic side, we are told that it has brought about uh, much improvement in the sense that of the countries which have uh, grown biotech, um, the figures I have here are the 26 countries grew nearly 192 million hectares of biotech crops, uh, which is, this was the figure given in 2018. And the uh, some of the countries which have grown them more than others are the United States, Brazil, uh, and Canada. Uh, we in Pakistan, as, a, as our colleagues have mentioned, are still uh, grappling with this. 
because we have to uh, law making is one element uh, setting up committees of uh, scientists with knowledge and with uh, impartiality with neutrality and giving uh, a fair chance to those who bring about these uh, major these are big major changes it's a paradigm shift basically from the normal to the above normal and in that sense the uh, another figure i have here is that the economic gains from biotech crops reached nearly 186 billion dollars from 1996 to 2017 so these are uh, figures which uh, are of very high order however uh, the concurrent uh, methodology to find out what are the changes if you know uh, we talked of some of the colleagues of the success models and where are the negatives uh, they mentioned uh, that is where i think we'll have to uh, scientifically observe we'll scientifically have to come up with evidence that they don't uh, negatively impact because um, the europeans as you know have been going across the world and saying and this is how they justify their own policies uh, that they have some level of uh, negative impact on uh, human uh, behavior or the quality of food and other things possibly could be uh, affected from the so called safety criteria levels or standards whichever word you would like to use hence uh, for uh, a developing country like ours which needs major breakthroughs agroeconomy 19.3% of our gdp it uh, employs between 40 to 44 million of our people it requires a very major quantitative quantitative change in terms of productivity in terms of production in terms of um, upscaling incomes of farmers of growers and hence everything which uh, relates to it quality of education quality of health of employment opportunities has a great uh, potential if we can somehow uh, convince ourselves uh, through uh, these methodologies through these trials through these uh, experiments uh, which would determine um, without any uh, uh, without any apprehensions that they would have deleterious effect on the health of our people and of the animals concerned so i i for one uh, have no open mind about it and i think we need to strengthen our committees which uh, actually um, examine these issues and we have to give them uh, the confidence and we have to uh, put in people uh, both a uh, uh, highly uh, celebrated scientists on this panel have said that the uh, level of our scientists is global it's world class uh, and this they have maintained standards of excellence i was very happy to hear that uh, i only hope that we do uh, publish some of our research papers in the very top global uh, magazines of the world Uh, which will examine some of these things uh, we can academically pursue this through our research uh, orientation uh, which would put us on the global stage as far as uh, the uh, research methodologies of uh, this uh, technology is concerned and the biosafety guidelines in the country could be revisited we would uh, we would be more than happy to uh, look at our regulatory uh, institutional mechanisms and um, the uh, as far as the quality what really pakistan needs is a very major breakthrough in our seed technology um, processes and that is one area where we have lagged behind uh, but with the quality of scientists as i'm just uh, in hearing uh, that should not be uh, an obstruction a hindrance or an impediment uh, to for us to uh, move ahead Uh, we have some very um, i'm sure even uh, uh, right at the top and younger people coming up because now we have uh, scientific 
disciplines throughout the country in many most of our universities. All we have to do is look at the success stories around the world and see why, why our production of our five major crops, wheat, cotton, rice, uh, sugarcane, and maize. How do we compare regionally? How do we compare globally? And of our livestock uh, industry, which is mostly uh, cows, buffaloes, goats, and sheep. How do they impact? And then how do our fruits, our vegetables? Uh, one of the areas where we could do a lot better, of course, is uh, marketing. Marketing both internally and externally, uh, because Pakistan really needs to upgrade its uh, institutional resources, uh, whereby uh, we could, I think, uh, and given our uh, closeness now to China through the CPEC, the, the, the second phase of CPEC, first phase was connectivity, second is going to be promote industry, agriculture, services, industries, construction, uh, and others which hopefully will lead us uh, into those uh, areas where one day big, uh, we Pakistanis will become proud for our scientists that they can compete with the best in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Farah Sahib. I mean, we're grateful to you for all your comments. And uh, this is our, uh, I don't know, it, it's a big chance for us that if you being there, if nothing can be done, then I'm afraid we will not be able to do anything. So we are looking forward to you. And because you are a custodian of so many things, you are aware of all which had been happening in the country. And then I'm, I'm sure you can help us. And especially, you know, if, you, if we could put the regulatory affair uh, on its proper scientific footing, it will be a big, big help, you see. Thank you so much, sir. And we hope to meet you again sometime. We have uh, compiled a, a small booklet on status of agricultural biotechnology in the country, and we will uh, present it to you. It, it, it gives the whole picture, the current picture, you know, that what the search is being done in the country uh, on all crops. You see, up till now, the biotechnology has been merely concentrated on cotton, you see. And I think it is important that we also streamline the fear of cotton. But you see, its impact of biotechnology in all other crops is also as important as in cotton, you see, especially in wheat, you see. And as Dr. Jones from Australia has also remarked that why don't we have a wheat, uh, you know, genetically modified or uh, gene editing being done in heat with, where there is a lot of uh, potential. And mashallah, we have expertise in all these areas in the country, you see. And I think if we could uh, organize ourselves, uh, you know, we can take use of all these expertise. Thank you, sir, once again. And uh, I, I, all I want to say something or shall I request Maha? for the concluding remarks. Okay. <clears throat> uh, before we, we call Maha, can we show the second and the third poll, please? Okay. So the second poll. Yeah. The second poll is the impacts of GM crops are consistent and well-documented in peer-reviewed studies. Kindly respond, please. So we have 116 participants. This is going to be a short one. So is it true, false, or not sure? Okay, so 69% uh, voted for true. Thank you very much. Now let's move on to the third poll. So what topic on crop biotech would you like to know more about? Uh, food safety, environmental issues, health issues and concerns, new products, 
labeling, coexistence of GM and organic crops, and international trade. Okay, 62% has voted, and the highest is coexistence of organic and GM crops. Thank you very much for participating. Now uh, we can. Thank you. Thank you, Ola. I'm Thank you. Can I, can, I, can I comment on the polls? The, in first poll, uh, only 4% people said that there is a reduction in pesticide use. Whereas uh, Dr. Books has said that there was 19% reduction in the use of pesticides. Thank you, sir, for clarifying that. Yeah, well, that's more scientific. I mean, <laughs> anyway, okay, thank you. Thank you. No, that, that's that's issue of perception, actually. Yeah. That percep perception is still not there. Yes, that's right. You see, uh, that was one of the purpose of this webinar as well, you see, you know. Yeah. Well, that may request uh, Dr. Maha, who is the uh, global coordinator of the international services for the acquisition of agri-biotech application. IS AAA, you see many people who not know the whole, what does IS AAA stand for, you see, you know. So I thought it's better if we spell it out, you see, you know, that it is, the International Service for the Acquisition of Agri-Biotech Applications, you see, IS AAA. She is also the Executive Director of the Belarusian Biotechnology Information Center, MABIC. In both positions, she is working in the developing world to create the political will to embrace innovations brought about by modern agri-biotechnology. And we have been so happy that she has visited us a number of times and we had had very useful interactions and uh, her, um, her skills in science communication. We have been able to use that a lot, you see. Thank you so much, Maha, and uh, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kausar. It's really nice to be here. Like what Professor Kausar says, I come to Pakistan every year at least once, sometimes I even come to, uh, twice. Unfortunately, you know, this has to be done uh, through a webinar. So on behalf of AISA, and um, Professor Kausa, thank you for spelling out AISA, but I think I'll also take this opportunity to say that AISA is evolving. We are looking into going into various other biosciences that is going to be supporting agriculture. So we are going to look at wider scope uh, to support agriculture, and we'll be doing that announcement soon. So uh, now I would like to take um, this opportunity to thank um, Honorable Minister. Now we all spoke about the political will, but today we have the minister sitting through for two hours with us. So things we hope will change in Pakistan. And um, thank you, Professor Kausar Malik, again, for uh, and your esteemed um, uh, university, Foreman Christian College, and also the Lahore chapter of Pakistan Biotechnology Information Center for hosting this webinar. Thank you, Crop Life Asia, for your support. And of course, all the um, excellent lineup of speakers, Dr. Ikra Khan uh, for moderating the session, um, Dr. Graham Brook for your excellent presentation, Dr. Shahid Mansoor and Dr. Zafar Hayat. Um, it was really very interesting to, I, I took some notes on the takeaway message from each speaker. Now, um, we all know, uh, Prof. Kausar said this, Pakistan is a very important country in South Asia. And um, Pakistan has got, has got very good local research on GM crops, cotton, chickpea, sugarcane, rice, corn, sunflower, mustard, and uh, wheat. So just like what Professor Kausar mentioned, what Pakistan needs now is political will. And we hope with the Honorable Minister sitting with us, um, his colleagues will look at biotechnology in a uh, better light. Dr. Shahi he rightfully pointed out that it's not just food security, but it's nutritional security, especially for a country like Pakistan, which is really important. And modern biotechnology and the other tools are, is the one which can help us to achieve nutrition uh, security. Uh, can you hear me? My internet shows it, that I'm unstable. Okay. It's okay. So uh, Dr. Shahir also mentioned all the other challenges. Yeah. 
um, currently being faced uh, in agriculture in Pakistan. Honorable Minister mentioned that as well. And this is why modern biotechnology is very, very important. Uh, Dr. Zafar raised the issue of mixed messages among scientists. Now, this is not new in Pakistan. We have many countries where scientists themselves are divided. And um, I've seen scientists who work on stem cell, they present all this uh, safety analysis, the test done on stem cells to prove that it is safe. But when we present our analysis on uh, biotech crop, they are very skeptical. So you, we see the double standard. It is nothing to do with science. It is nothing to do with uh, biotech crops not being safe. It is just the values, the ideology. And this is what we need to address. And that is why AISA together with Fabic, um, both at, in Lahore as well as Karachi, we are actively engaged with outreach program capacity building in um, Pakistan. But of course, the battle is uh, not an easy one to, uh, to, to win. We need continuous, regular outreach program uh, to engage with all stakeholders. Today, we spoke about biotech crops, but then the other tool is gene editing. And this is going to even open more doors, especially in developing countries. In Pakistan, with GM crops itself, we are active. Now, Imagine if we have gene editing, the public sector, we will see more public sector research. We will see more small companies coming into the uh, into this uh, space. To me, as an educator as well, I'm sure Professor Kausal Malik will share the same sentiment. We see and we, we groom biotechnology, biological sciences, uh, graduates. Now, where are they going to go if we want to put a stop to biotech uh, development and biotech industry? So... For us, biotechnology, gene technologies, not only is for food security, nutritional security, but also so that our young graduates will have job opportunities. So this is where we think, you know, this um, uh, technology should get more support from all uh, stakeholders. So with that, I would really like to wish uh, uh, Pakistan all the best. Uh, Pakistan has got so much of potential. You have got the best brains, actually. Uh, in many, not only in agriculture, in many scientific um, uh, areas. So agriculture has got so much of potential to try with biotechnology. And um, we also need to feed the growing uh, population in Asia. We are looking at, we're living in the uh, time of culture can be during crisis. So we need all the technologies to be in our toolkit. And, um, the, and finally, I just want to mention also, we are looking at, Everyone is waiting for a vaccine for COVID-19 to come out. And where is this coming out? It's going to use mRNA technology and other gene editing technology. So why are we having this double standard of closing an eye on agriculture and expecting um, drugs and pharmaceutical vaccines and uh, other bio compounds to come from biotechnology? So let's look at everything in an open um, mind with, with science guiding us. So my last message is to the critics of GM technologies, please speak to the farmers before speaking for them and let us support the farmers. So uh, they, they really need the technologies just like us. Today, we are all together because of technology and farmers need technologies as well. So with that, thank you very much uh, to everyone. Thank you very much. Professor Kausa, your mic. Dr. Kalsar, you're muted. <laughs> it boots automatically, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you see, so I was saying that, that I was thanking Maha and for uh, her very excellent concluding remarks. I would like to thank all of you and especially the panelists, you see, and, and uh, above all, my minister, Mr. Fakhar Imam Saab, for time out, sir, do you want to say something, sir? Okay. No, I, I was very uh, impressed by Ma'am Maha's uh, concluding remarks because she's covered the whole canvas uh, and uh, seems to be quite uh, impressed with uh, your colleagues, the scientists uh, in our Pakistani community. And I must commend her for her. Uh, close uh, proximity in uh, sharing information, sharing knowledge, sharing values above all and sharing uh, 
our historical perspective and uh, the future that the young, uh, talented, capable um, people of Pakistan have in the future. In fact, uh, what is so, I think, uh, creative and innovative of the young population of Pakistan is the sky is the limit. All we have to do is uh, provide them with the opportunities uh, through uh, centers of excellence. And that is what I think we should uh, put our best foot forward so that the young people of this country, both young boys and young girls and women in particular, uh, should take advantage like uh, you, ma'am, uh, with your extraordinary uh, commitment uh, in promoting uh, relationship between your state and ours. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your comments. And uh, we will uh, looking forward to Maha's visit again. And, uh, and Ola and all, all, all colleagues from ISAAA. And uh, I thank you, uh, especially Dr. Ram Brooks. And I hope that the pandemic situation in UK also improves as, as in Pakistan, we are again having the second wave, but I hope and pray that all over the world, people are safe and healthy. So I thank you all if, if Maha, if uh, Ola has to say something. Yeah, I would like to thank everybody for the, the support and cooperation. This was a very short preparation, but we were able to deliver. We were able to reach 146 participants. And so we're happy to note that we're also streaming live at FB and there is also a YouTube connection. So hopefully we, would, we were able to reach more people than we expect to reach. Thank you very much yeah. for your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Okay. All the best. So much. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. 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 bye.